If you're just joining us, welcome to Engaging Students with Online Breakout Group Activities. And today we just have a couple of goals for our workshop, and these are the order in which we're going to go through these different goals today. We're going to look at what are some of the benefits of these online breakout rooms. I also have some practical tips and strategies for you uh, because I think that's a big part of navigating online breakout groups. And then, of course, we're going to look at maybe a couple of different um, activities. Actually, I think I have about five of them. Um, so maybe this will give you some ideas for how you could switch up some of the traditional uses for breakout rooms. All right, so moving over to that text chat in there. If you could just go ahead and introduce yourself. Um, so I can give you some prompts that are up on the screen. Who are you? What do you teach? Um, let me know what do you like about breakout rooms or what is it that you want to know more about? I'll pause and I'll let all of you type. Welcome back, Dana. No problem. Um, it's just not a, a normal day if there aren't some technical glitches. There's only a few of us in here, so um, you know if you you don't prefer to type in the text chat, you're more than welcome to turn on the microphone. Hey, thank you, Jinsuk. Introduction health promotion. Ooh, that's interesting. Okay, so you kind of like some of the similarities, some of that, you know, maybe more face to face contact that we would get um, in a traditional classroom, um, but just how you want to better engage students. So I know Dana just rejoined us, so um, I'd still be typing. I'm going to go ahead while you're doing that and just move to the next slide and I'll come back. So there are some benefits to breakout rooms. Good, I like, I like that answer. So you, you like that they offer students a more intimate space. Excellent. Now some of these benefits to breakout rooms um, might be familiar to you, uh, but I often think that when we have breakout rooms available to us, we should utilize them. We're often looking for some type of connection in our online courses, and if we only lecture our students, then I think it's a missed opportunity. So again, these are just some of the benefits, and I'm sure there are more, but it's this ability for you to create connections, right? You can help students connect with each other, with you, um, also with their coursework. You can find out maybe things that intrigued them and also areas where they struggled. Um, you get to be the one who helps facilitate this um, collaboration. So you can 
come up with specific objectives for them, activities. So again, it's this idea that they're not just passengers in their online course. You also get to humanize it, right? They can hear your voice. If you turn on your webcam, they can see you. Um, and so then it, it stops just being this kind of course that's in, in cyberspace, right? Uh, so you're really building again on those connections. And of course, there are some different things that you can do while you're in these breakout sessions. And it's not just something for synchronous sessions, but specific to breakout rooms. You can give them activities for brainstorming, problem solving, uh, where they can build something. So these are all the different types of advantages that we have at our fingertips. And of course, I always want to um, bring up regular and substantive interaction. It is a federal uh, policy, so we do have to abide by it. But um, again, it's this idea that online courses are not enough for our students. They have to have interaction with you as an instructor. And so if you're using your synchronous sessions and your breakout rooms, that's a great way to help meet this regulation. So. If you are interested in learning more about regular and substantive interaction, I, I did put uh, the website up there on the screen, but I can send this to you as well in a follow-up slide or follow-up email, I guess I should say. So I wanted to actually talk about some of the practical tips and strategies and things that I've learned along the way as I've been playing with all of our different types of synchronous sessions and web conferencing tools. Oh, strange, sorry about that. I clicked two slides at once. There are these um, four steps that are involved with setting up our breakout rooms. Um, so I've listed those on the screen for you. You know, I like just kind of going over these, but I also want to talk a little bit more in depth about each of them, because I think there are some things that um, I've learned through trial and error. So there's this idea that we have to do some pre-planning, and, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But um, it's not this idea that you click a button and you start your synchronous session and your breakout groups and everything goes according to plan. So um, there's usually some structure that you've built up and that's in place um, even before your students enter that session with you. You also get to log into your web conferencing tool of choice. So NIU actually has an abundance of web conferencing tools to choose from. And I honestly think we have more than many institutions. So we have licenses for Microsoft Teams, Blackboard Collaborate, which is what we're in today, and then Zoom. Um, out of curiosity, if you wouldn't mind just typing in the chat, uh, which do you prefer or are you not sure? Any preferences? Great, okay, so the session looks pretty familiar to you, Dinsuk. Teams, interesting, okay, great. I just asked this because if you have any specific questions, maybe about your web conferencing tool of choice, hang on to those. We can always get into those at the Q&A session towards the end. All right. There's also, of course, the part where we have to create the, the breakout groups and assign students to each of these activities. You know, I have learned that creating breakout groups is uh, most successful when you do this once you've already started the session. I know sometimes uh, faculty want to assign the groups and have it ready to go um, before students even enter, um, but there can be some, some difficulties involved with that. And, if you're wondering what causes some of those problems, oftentimes when we create our web conferencing session, we give out a guest link to our students so they can just click on it and join the session, which is great. And that's exactly what I would encourage you to do. But if they're using that guest link, and there's a good chance that they are not logged in with their licensed student user account. Um, so even if you've created the breakout groups ahead of time, it may not recognize them when they log in because they came in through a guest link. So um, again, I do encourage you to try to create those breakout groups um, during the session. It may take a little bit out of your schedule, um, but just a couple of minutes, and it usually runs smoother when you go that route. And 
of course, there's always the end of this where we have to return from the breakout groups um, into the main session and debrief as a class together. All right, so I did promise that there are some things involved here with the logistics of how to run these breakout groups smoothly. Um, so the first thing is recording. Depending on which web conferencing session you're using, uh, you may have some options for recording. For instance, I've learned with Zoom, you can record locally to your computer or to your personal device, or you could record um, and this could go to the cloud. I used to think that the cloud would be easier um, and it would actually come with more storage, and that is actually not the case. So given the option, I would encourage you to record locally to your own personal device uh, because there is a limitation on cloud storage. So uh, you won't actually know what the limitation is until you bump into it. And then it might tell you that it has stopped recording. So that was one of my first tips for you. Uh, as far as pre-planning goes for your breakout groups, I encourage you to come up with some sort of an outline and design document. And one of the things that you'll want to know about is how much time you should allot for each activity. How long is it going to take for your students to work together in a group? How long is it going to take for you to, to put them into groups? Are there going to be breaks? You're going to want to schedule those breaks, know when they occur. And, you know, do you need a five minute break? Do you need a 10 minute break? Um, and so put all of this into your planning document so that you're going to achieve your objectives with all of these breakout rooms. The other thing that I would caution you about is you may want to test out your platform ahead of time. So now it sounds like uh, Jinsuk, you're, you're probably using Blackboard Collaborate. You're already pretty familiar with it. Uh, but if you ever want to test out the capabilities of another web conferencing session, or if you want to practice some more to get even more comfortable with the tool that you're using, you can always set up a consultation with a CITL staff member. And we'll be happy to make sure that you feel comfortable using whatever web conferencing session and whichever breakout room setup you have in mind. And alongside that, again, this is all I think kind of falls under the pre-planning is to create shareable documents. And um, I'm gonna show you how you can do that here in just a moment. But one of the things that I've learned is if you wanna use your breakout rooms for something other than conversation, maybe you want your students in those groups to work on um, a worksheet or, or something of that nature, you're going to have to have those documents pre-prepared before the session starts. So part of this is you have to create um, as many documents as you need. For instance, uh, if you're anticipating having five groups in your class, you might create a document um, and then you're going to make copies of it. And you're just going to give each of them a different name. So it could be worksheet one, worksheet two, worksheet three, etc. And so this way, Everybody will have, each of those groups is going to have access to the exact same um, type of a worksheet, but each group will have their own to work on. So you have to think about creating, you know, copies of your worksheets, but then you also have to make sure that they are shareable. And so this means you've got to make it a document that they can edit while they're in their breakout groups. So um, I do encourage you to, again, think about this ahead of time before you start your session. And also make sure that you have those links available. And I would put them in the text chat of your synchronous session before you start the breakout groups. That's the easiest way to distribute them. And last but not least on here, this is one that I think we often forget. Um, once you come back as a whole class to um, debrief, you can you can go ahead and resume recording. So that's something that I, I often forget about. I know that's a, a tricky thing to remember. Maybe you can even put a sticky note on your computer. Um, but you, if you as an instructor went and hopped around into each of the different breakout rooms, um, by the time you come back together as a class, you'll have to resume that recording. Questions so far? Hi, oh, Megan, this is Jin Suk. Um, Hello, Jin Suk. Hi. Um, 
I use the, the breakout group uh, discussions in my classes. And uh, like I, uh, I already assigned the groups. And in, in the beginning of the semester, uh, I use that pre-created groups. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it was done like quickly, relatively quickly. So it's not like I start with the breakout sessions. I have uh, like all, everybody, you know, uh, in the one place, just, you know, collaborate and, you know, do uh, some things and then there is a breakout group discussion in the middle of the class. Mm -hmm. uh, so I pre-made the uh, group assignments and I used it you know, when I start the breakout group discussions and it worked in, in the beginning, but in the middle of the semester, I'm talking about last semester, it didn't work. The pre-assigned uh, pre group uh, didn't work. So I have to assign one by one to each group, you know, right before the uh, breakout session. So it, it took a lot of time, you know, doing that in the middle of the class because the pre uh, made groups didn't work. So I don't know if it is a blackboard issue uh, or not, because I mean, it worked before, like it like first to half of the semester it worked too, but like from the middle, it didn't work. Do sure. Um, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, and it is a little bit unreliable um, oh. with those pre-assigned groups. So uh -huh. um, unfortunately, I think you will run into that with any of the web conferencing tools. Um, but another workaround um, that might save you some time is um, if you create um, a document that says group one and it has all the students listed in group one and it has group two and all the students listed in it if you share that mm -hmm. on your screen um, when you create the breakout groups um, you mm -hmm. could just do self-enroll and you can ask the students please okay. go to the uh, group that i that you see on the on the screen okay and if anybody makes a wrong decision, uh, you as an instructor can still manually reassign them to a group. So uh, that's another, you know, option. Okay. Yeah, this sounds good. Um, another, I mean, maybe you will talk about it later, but another issue is that um, I, you know, for example, in the past semester, uh, I had uh, uh, seven groups. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it takes time for me to go to each group and, you know, listen to what they are saying. Kind of, you know, I, I'm like a supervising or seven groups, right? But I cannot do it at once. I have to go to each group one by one. Um, and I, I really didn't have a lot of time to listen to them or talk with them. I mean, I, I you know, I give yeah, them absolutely. Research, Especially if you have a lot of students. Yeah, so it is really difficult to you know engage it deep, deeply into the discussion or anything. It's just checking how they are doing, and ask you know questions, ask them questions. You know, is there? Well, I have a couple of suggestions questions? for you. Mm -hmm. uh, so hold that thought. I've got a couple of ideas for actual activities that you can do um, to balance that because it is a lot of work to bounce from every single group and feel like you mm -hmm. spent enough time with each of them. Right. So if you hold that thought, I promise I, I have some ideas for you. Okay. Excellent. Um, one of the things that I, I do get a lot of questions, though, um, about is how do I create shareable documents for my students? Um, so there are some different things involved here. Um, some people I know have actually um, used Google Docs. And if you're an avid you know, Google Doc person and you feel comfortable with that, you can certainly do so. Um, but another way that you can do this is just through your NIU account. So we do have that available for you. 
And so I, I've got a little bit of a screenshot here. This is actually just on the NIU homepage and you can go to Quick Links and click on Office 365. All right, and so I, I do have some different uh, options here. So I'm gonna keep double clicking, pardon me. Let's try this one. Um, so you can create your um, shareable documents. So as soon as you click on Office 365, um, you're gonna want to click on the option that says OneDrive the little cloud icon. I took a screenshot of it. And then you're going to go to my files um, and you can add a new file. You have a couple of different options for how you want to do that. So for instance, you could um, upload an existing document, maybe it's something you already saved on your desktop, or you could just create brand new right there in the OneDrive. Um, so once you once you've done that, um, you've saved your document to um, the cloud, and it could be anything. It could be a Microsoft Word document, it could be PowerPoint slides that you want your students to work on. So, um, you know, kind of use your, um, use your imagination on what you want to use for that. And then, I think I put these slides out of order. Um, you're going to return to your files, and this is the part where you can um, change the settings. So you can click the three dots, and then you're going to click share and you're going to want to click share with anyone. So that's the screenshot again that you see here. And you'll notice I also had more settings down there listed at the bottom, uh, but it was this idea again that uh, anybody who has access to this document can edit it. So again, I, I want to do something with my students, maybe other than just talk in their breakout groups. Um, this is a good idea, you know, if you want to get them involved in a project. So you can distribute anything you want to them, um, create a shareable link, put it in the, the chat of your synchronous session, and when they go into their breakout groups, they'll be all set. They're going to have these items that, in which they can work with, that they can edit, um, and that they can make, you know, kind of adjustments on their own individual work. Uh, can can you uh, can you go back uh, uh, when you say um, upload a new doc uh, upload a word document or create a new one and then can you go next one? Yes. Sorry, I think I put these slides out of order. Here we go. Return to your files. What do you mean by return to your files? Um, so once you've saved your uh, file, you're going to go back uh -huh. to this. Um, oops, I keep the wrong one. You're going to go back to this screen, mm -hmm. and uh, right below it, I didn't have enough room to take a screenshot of it, but you'll see a list of all of the things that you've saved in the OneDrive. Mm -hmm. So when you do that, so you mean I go to the file I saved in OneDrive? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Great question. And when and click share, uh, share. Uh, the people so people you choose then, there uh, is there like uh, you can see the list of the classes you are teaching, uh, something like that. No, this is just like a, you're literally creating a link to your document. And so you're deciding who has access to your document. So if you click like this bubble, like it says anyone, um, anybody who clicks on your on your document now can type in it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's probably so, the easiest way. So I should choose anyone and then uh, then I can share it with um, uh, my students in the breakout groups later? Yes. Yes. Okay. Great questions in So I get a lot of questions about that because I know faculty really want to do something with their students in those groups, but they don't know how to create these um, documents that are that are savable um, and shareable. So this is one way to do it. Um, and if we have time at the end of the session, I'm happy to actually do a live demonstration. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
it passed a little bit earlier. Uh, you talked about recording breakup sessions, so uh, I so I can record uh, each breakout sessions on so, cloud, right? No, and actually that's what brings us to this slide right here, because these are some mm -hmm. quick tips that I've learned about uh, breakout groups in general. Oh, not, so, not recording them, okay. Yeah, so the first thing you're gonna wanna do is if you have um, items that you want your students to um, access in their breakout groups, make sure you share the links to those items in the text chat before you start the breakout groups. That's mm -hmm. the easiest way to do it. Um, other things to remember, cloud storage is limited. So if you have the option, I would encourage you to try to save your recording to your, uh, to your personal device. Breakout room activity is not recorded. And this is true actually of any of the web conferencing tools that we have available. So this could be Teams, Zoom, or Collaborate. It will mm -hmm. record activity when you are all together in the main session. Uh, but once you, they go into the breakout rooms, that activity is not recorded. Which, of course, brings us to the fourth and final reminder. Once you come back together as a whole class, make sure you hit resume recording, uh, because usually it doesn't do that for you. we can move on and now we can actually look at some of those breakout room activities um, so and I have five of them for you with some specific details on how you can really mix these up and you can kind of tailor them for your own classroom needs so one of the first uh, breakout activities that I think all of us may be uh, familiar with or we've heard some version of is this idea of think, pair, share. Um, have, have any of you heard of that at all? Okay, well, think, pair, share is really this idea that as an instructor, you present a new concept you ask students to, um, have you ever heard of the idea of think, pair, share? Um, I'll even type it in the text chat. Okay. So it's this idea that as an instructor, you give um, a new concept for your students to think about. Um, then as students, you ask them to pair up um, and they share their thoughts on it. And that's a kind of a very common theme. There, there's um, something you'd see in a face-to-face -face class. You can emulate it in an online um, environment, but we want to take it a step further, right? Like we don't just want to lecture, have our students talk about it, share some ideas, and then come back together as a group. Uh, we want to do something a little bit more imaginative, and that's where these breakout room activities come in. So one of them that I like to start off with is four corners or more debate. All right. And so this is um, a great idea that you can even use to start your class. This could be a really good icebreaker activity. Sometimes students, um, they'll log into their synchronous session and they go quiet and they don't want to talk to you. So this is really how you can encourage them to start talking. So what you would do is you would post um, kind of a, a provocative statement or a question something that really doesn't have a clear yes or no answer. Um, so, and this is just an example, one of many that I put up on here on the screen for you. And you could say, public schools should never be allowed to ban books. Um, and I even have some examples of what are some books that are commonly banned. Um, and you're going to ask your students, you're going to set up breakout groups, but you're going to do self-enroll groups. Um, and so they could go into number one, which is strongly agree. Number two is mostly agree with exceptions. Number three is somewhat disagree. And number four is strongly disagree. Ask them to go to the, the group that they most align with. Um, and there they'll be surprised to find um, other students who, who kind of shared their perspective. And in their groups, ask them to come up with a concrete, specific example to support their, 
their decision. When you bring them all back together into the main synchronous session, um, you can talk about uh, the conversations that they had in their in their groups. Uh, you can ask somebody to present one student from each group what they came up with. And you can even ask them um, after they've heard all of the different arguments for why they they chose their particular corner. Uh, you can ask students would they would they consider changing their their opinion? Would they go to a different group uh, based on what they've heard? So that's our four corners debate. Um, it's a good use of those self-enrollment breakout groups. Remember we had talked about before, sometimes um, when you're assigning students to breakout groups, it can, it can be a little bit of a tedious process. You might have to devote a couple of minutes just to getting everybody assigned to a group. Uh, but this one takes care of the problem for you. Uh, students have to pick which group they're gonna go to. Here's another option. You can ask students within their groups to do some peer editing and feedback. Um, now, my background is in English and I've learned over the time of when I ask students to do uh, peer editing, I have to be very specific with what I want them to do because otherwise they'll just give them kind of generic responses of, oh, that looks good. Um, and, and I really want them to get some feedback that is actually useful in helping students to revise their work. So I might give them a rubric ahead of time. And this is something I could either email to students before the synchronous course session, or again, I could create those, um, those links, right, where I have students click on the rubric uh, before I put them into their breakout groups. I'm also going to give them a set of questions that they have to answer. So one of the things that I could do is I could say, find the strongest sentence in the introductory paragraph. I'm going to make them look at this introductory paragraph and identify what they think is the strongest part. I might ask them to identify which area needs to be revised. And I might ask them to actually label and identify which sentence um, needs some work. You know, I could ask them things like, what type of uh, introductory um, attention grabber did they use? Did they ask a question? Did they use a startling statement? Um, so again, I, I could ask them to do a series of questions during these peer feedback and evaluation sessions. You're also going to want to time these sessions. How long should they have in which to read the document and to provide uh, suggestions and feedback? You might be able to get to all students in a class period, or you might start doing this in, in phases. So this week, you know, five students are going to have their work um, evaluated by their peers. Next week, it's going to be a different set of five students. So these are things that you can think about. But again, as they're editing each other's work um, and providing suggestions, you as an instructor can spend a little bit of time hopping around to each of the groups. All right, so number three, this one is a kind of a lot of fun. It's where you ask the students to solve a problem. And there are a couple of different ways that you can set this up. Oftentimes when I think of breakout groups, I think that the creativity comes from your assignment prompt, not just the technology. So one way that you could do this is you could share a document with your students before you put them in breakout groups and each group is going to be responsible for a different question on the on the worksheet so group one could do question one group two could answer question two and so everybody is going to be working on the same document um, but different groups are going to be focused on different sections that's one way to do it you could give um, copies of the same document so um, again, and if you don't want everybody working on the same document at the same time, uh, you give copies to each of the groups and you say, I want you to solve this equation or solve this problem. Um, and then when you bring them back together as a whole group, we're going to have the students compare. 
did the groups um, arrive at different conclusions? Did they have a different thought process? Um, so it, it's oftentimes about the journey as much as it is the answer. Um, so you can see what students are, are doing in each group. I also like this idea for uh, fill in the study guide. This is a, a great way to get students prepared for a large assessment. So whether that's an exam or a project, um, you can have students come to class with the intent that they are going to be responsible for filling in a section of the study guide. Um, if you give your students a really long study guide, the odds are you're not gonna be able to get to every single item on the study guide. But instead, if you break them up into breakout groups, they're going to feel incentivized to find answers for their specific section because they know that their peers are relying on them to fill out this, this form that's ultimately going to help them study for that large exam or that large project. So again, it's this, uh, this idea of getting students involved. You know, what's at stake for them? Why do they need to, to work together in this group? And the last one here is this idea of race to completion. So Jinsuk, you had mentioned earlier that it can be difficult for you to get to every single group. Uh, this can be a, a fun way for you to bounce around and feel like you've assisted every single group. Um, what you can do is you can ask students to take their worksheet in their, in their breakout groups, um, and they're gonna have two goals. Of course, we want them to accurately try to answer all of the questions, but they want to, you want to see, um, you know, how fast can they answer all of them. So you can bounce around from group to group, but you're going to specify that you will answer one question while you're in their um, breakout group. So this can be really exciting. You can give them, you know, five minutes for them to look over the document, and if they have a question as a group, they can decide. Um, what question they want to ask you. You can even get creative with this and you can say, I will answer one question, but it has to be a yes or no question. Um, and so then you'll make an appearance in each group and you'll provide that same level of assistance to each of the groups. When they feel that they have completed the document, they can return to the main class session. Um, and they don't have to wait for you to end the breakout group. So that's another way um, really for them to to start working together, um, showing all that teamwork and, and working towards a common goal. And I think we've arrived. We're doing really well. We've got about 15 minutes left. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess I actually have two left. Um, so some of these things that we can actually do with our students in these breakout groups, um, I've given you a couple of different examples. You can ask them to work on an essay question, right? One person in the group is going to be the designated writer, but they could respond to an essay question. It could be fill in the blank. Again, this is going back to this idea of worksheets. Um, this could be equations, um, calculations, anything like that. You could be using graphs or maps. Uh, maybe you want your students each to be, each group is responsible for creating an informative PowerPoint slide. Um, so each group could be working on a different PowerPoint slide. Uh, you could also ask your students to build a flow chart. So this is kind of exciting. You can give them um, some sort of a, a question that they have to chart and document, and then you share a blank document with them while they're in their groups together they're going to come up with an actual uh, map of, of how they arrived at their answer. So you can kind of see, I, I do have a couple of little um, screenshots available for you. One of them looks actually like a math worksheet and the other one looks like something that they could build either in a, a Word document, it could be a PowerPoint slide, um, it could be a Google Doc, whatever you're comfortable with. But it's this idea that the students are creating their own work in those groups. All right, and now, now I'm at my last one. Uh, the other one here is an option where you could create escape rooms. And so this is actually something that I did through the use of Google Forms. So you do need a Gmail account, um, but this was an idea where I created um, a link to my breakout room and I use this as a study guide for an exam. So 
as students would go through each of the forms, uh, they would have to select an answer. Everything was multiple choice. If they got an answer right, um, it would direct them to a harder question. If they got it wrong, um, it would take them to a, a repeat type of question, something that will allow them to practice maybe that skill set that they um, that they made an incorrect choice on. And the best part is because these are multiple choice questions, it's auto graded. So students know immediately at the end of the exercise um, how they did. So this is again a great exercise to have them do as groups. Right together, they have to determine uh, what is the correct answer. So um, you can even have a, an example of one for you. Let's see. I can throw this in the. I just put it in our text chat. Let me know if that works. If it doesn't, um, I can send you a different link. Uh, but this is an actual example of a breakout room activity that my students could do. So it gives them something new and different to experience. Uh, my escape room was all about murderous plans. Alrighty, so if you have any questions, I would always say establish a communication plan, email me, call me. Uh, we can do a consultation together. We can do a, a virtual session if you want to test out anything. But now I'm going to open it up to you. Are there any questions? Uh, can you explain the escape room again? Uh, then like two use that I need to create those questions, right? Yes. So I will actually send you an email with um, some follow-up information. I have a um, YouTube uh, tutorial that talks about how you can create uh, breakout rooms, or mm -hmm. I shouldn't say breakout rooms, I should say escape rooms. Mm -hmm. But all that I used for this was uh, Google Forms. So um, Google Forms is free to any any user, you just have to have a Gmail account. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then mm -hmm. should, should they also need to have a Gmail account, students? What just mean? They don't have to. Oh. Nope. You'll create a shareable link, um, just kind of like the one that I don't know if it worked for you or not, um, but I threw it in the text chat. Um, but you literally just share that link and anybody who um, mm -hmm. clicks on it should be able to go through the escape room. OK. Oh, uh, and before you talk when you talked about race to completion um you said that students can come back to the main room when they are done right yes oh uh, is this something i need to set up like that or uh because when i do the uh, breakout uh room settings i don't think they can come back to main room by themselves i need to end the breakout group sessions, this, how I... Um, let's see, you use Blackboard Collaborate. Uh -huh. um, I will double check. I know in Zoom, students can return to the main breakout room. Um, I will double check on Collaborate. The mm -hmm. alternative, though, is uh, when they think they've completed their activity, they could just type the word done in the text uh -huh. chat, um, and then you'll know the order in which each group uh, completed the activity. Mm -hmm. Okay. But that's a great question, and I'll look into that, Jinsuk. Mm -hmm. Are there any of these activities that interest you or that you, you would want to try? Yeah, I like the four corners debate idea. Uh, but I'm a little bit worried about uh, the number of students because, uh, like, for example, I have about 40 students right now. I'm it's asynchronous this semester, so it doesn't matter. But if I have, like, 40 students in, in a synchronous class, that means there are 10 people in each corner. Uh, and I don't know how effective it would be if they have 10 in one group. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess it could work. But but I like the idea of the the four corners debate, so they can self-ignore to that. Um, 
grow. But like, for example, I have 40 students and four corners and like 35 students go to <laughs> corner one. <laughs> and I don't think it would be really effective in uh, discussions. Jinsuk, I think a, you know, a, an easy way to resolve that is um, knowing that you have a large roster, you could have a slide where you put 50% of the students in column A and 50% of the students in column B. Um, mm -hmm. And you just show that slide and you would say, okay, um, you know, students in column A, you know, if you strongly agree, um, click on room one, you know, and then you can say agree to, um, don't agree, three, strongly disagree is four. Um, and then everybody in column B, it's going to be the same thing, but they're going to go into rooms five, six, seven, and eight. Okay. Because students will look and, and they're going to just look at that screen and they're going to say, oh, that's me. Um, and, and they typically go right where you, um, right where you leave them. Okay. But I do like this idea that you're getting all of them involved and, you know, it's a synchronous session and it is hard to bounce from student to student. So um, using these breakout groups um, and mixing it up for them, it really is going to kind of add that level of engagement to to your course. Mm -hmm. So uh, when, you know, like, but that that is only for the like first part of the um, session because I mean, not everything is about like debatable topics, right? So no, not always. Um, but you know, I like this idea of breaking up your course. And um, when mm -hmm. we're in these Zoom sessions or collaborator teams, whatever your uh, tool of choice is, it can be draining for both you as the instructor and for your students to just sit in front of this webcam, um, you know, and and watch a lecture or be the person who's in charge of a lecture. Um, it, mm -hmm. You know, we often call it Zoom fatigue. And so this idea of putting them into breakout groups kind of uh, changes up the dynamics of your online course. So periodically, mm -hmm. you could take um, a moment to to have the four corner debate. Um, and then you could go maybe into a small lecture about new material. And then after that, you can put them into breakout groups and have each group working on a worksheet. Bye, Dana. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes, so I usually don't do lectures in the synchronous uh, meetings. I pre-recorded lectures. So, you know, how I um, structure is that they should uh, I mean, in theory, they should have uh, watched the lecture before coming in to the synchronous meetings. And Absolutely. I go, yeah, I go over the uh, like main ideas of the lecture uh, shortly, not like long lecture. Then, uh, uh, I mean, for this class, uh, you know, before the synchronous meetings, what they should do is that they should uh, uh, post an article about the topic of the day uh, in advance. Like today's topic is tobacco use, then they should find the articles about tobacco use. It could be a news article, could be a journal article, and post them in discussion board. And uh, after I go over the main ideas of the the lecture or the module, they are in they are in breakout groups and they talk about the articles they posted. So it's like five people in a group. Um, and then after the breakout group is done, they come back to the main room and uh, summarize what they talked about to the class. Excellent. Um, yeah, but the problem is, um, depending on the group composition or the personalities, some groups have really productive discussions. They talk, they talk about all their articles and summarize well. But in 
some groups um, they just they don't talk. They just, for example, exchange uh, the articles and read, it. <laughs> and then you know one person you know summarizes that, uh, and then present it later. So the level of engagement is just so different. It's so um, varying between groups, and I. Yeah, that's why I talked about how to engage them in each uh, group because they are so different. As an instructor, you can also assign roles to them. Um, and, and a fun way to do this is to um, tell them, okay, the first person who's going to talk about their article that they selected is going to be the uh, group member with the largest shoe size. Uh, and you could talk about, you know, like somebody else, um, whoever currently is the furthest away from the NIU DeKalb campus, they're the one in charge of recording the responses. Um, and you, you can get them kind of involved in laughing about this because now they have to talk to each other. They have to determine who lives where, who is the biggest shoe. Um, and you can give them just a whole bunch of, of different um, criteria for, you know, how they determine um, each role of the group members. And this way, um, by default, everybody has to participate. Yeah, I mean, I, I have the tool for that. I uh, give them uh, a point for presenting, like summarizing and presenting. Uh, and the, those are uh, like beyond this, uh, a certain number is like extra credit. So if they present, uh, more they get more extra credits so there is that you know motivation to present uh, so individual level you know they had you know they do that but the, still i think the like group dynamics in each group could be really different like there are really good groups and there are really you know quiet and very passive groups I mean, of course, I don't think there is no, I mean, it's not like there, there, is, there is a solution to everything. <laughs> but yeah, I was wondering if there is any other ways to engage them. Um, you know, I would ask the, the students, if you call on somebody, um, ask them to pick, you know, a number between 1 and 40. Um, you know, if they pick number 22, go look at number 22 on your roster, and, and that's the person um, who's going to be called on to speak next. But um, mm -hmm. I would make it a known fact that whatever method you choose, um, however you, you kind of randomly call on people, it's the idea that everybody is going to be called on. Um, mm -hmm. I, I often approach it with, I don't necessarily make my students turn on their, their webcams, um, mm -hmm. but I do expect them to participate in the class. Um, so they, they still have to respond to conversations. I can call on them. They could be volunteered by their peers. Um, so, so, you know, get them a kind of out of their comfort zone of being quiet. Mm -hmm. If you feel like maybe they just don't want to talk, um, then mm -hmm. ask them to respond to a specific question and everybody has to put their response um, in the text chat. Mm -hmm. well, again, it's this idea that they, they actually have to produce something to show their participation. It's not mm -hmm. participation and attendance should never be the same thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what you know about the four corners? Oh, do you, do you think uh, like having ten people in one corner or group uh, would be good for discussions? What do you think is too big? Like how many people? Like what is the optimum number of people in one group for breakout group sessions? I don't think there is a right or wrong answer to that. And I think um, it would be interesting to experiment uh, with both. I would look at what happens when you put them together in a larger group. Do they actually communicate more freely? Mm -hmm. And then try it again with a smaller group and, and compare your results. Mm -hmm. Okay. But there Ooh. is not a right or wrong. And mm -hmm. 
I think as students, they should be comfortable um, in both scenarios. I, I think that at some point in time in their academic career, they're going to be exposed to large groups as well as to some of these smaller mm -hmm. arrangements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Okay, great. Thank you for your answers. I had a lot of questions and you had good answers to that. Wonderful. I'm going to stop there.